So I wanted to test out my old audio system, of course, which is my new audio system, but kind of like the old one that I was using. So I really hope that this sounds as good as I think it's going to sound. And I hope you don't have any problems with the audio when I actually render this video and I release this video. So yesterday I posted on my socials on what you guys wanted really to learn on the channel. And I came across a very interesting comment about someone talking about, could you please make a video on how to pass OSCE exams? And I thought to myself, how exactly am I going to do this? And what exactly am I going to say in this particular video? Then I started to come up with the important things and important pointers that may lead you to get a very good mark in your OSCE exams. I know it's very difficult for some individuals that are coming from having been examined with OSCE stations that are projected to them coming to have physical exams. But back when I was training in medical school, we often had physical exams. We rarely had the projected exams. So I kind of like have an idea of how these exams work. And we've practiced them several times. I've examined several students on the ward on this particular OSCE exams. And we often tend to see a lot of things. Before I go any further, Big congratulations to the channel for reaching 13,000 subscribers. We did participate, if you did participate in the giveaway and you've gotten the book for the obstetric procedures, good for you. If you haven't, I'll leave a link tagged in the description. Head over there to download the book for the obstetrics procedures. If you haven't yet downloaded it, please do not send me emails anymore about getting the book because I've put the link in the description. Share this video with anyone who you think may benefit Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a season on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at passing OSCE exams. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So just a disclaimer as we do these OSCE things. Remember that this is just a guide. It's not the end all and be all, everything that you need to pass the exam. No, it's not going to be a substitute for actual studying, actual practice. Remember, the more you practice something, the better you get at it. In terms of physical examinations and procedures, there's a threshold to which you can reach. But there are certain things like history which constantly need to be perfected and the skill of history taking needs to constantly be worked on. So there are some things that will have a threshold that if you practice it a certain number of times, you will get the principle and you'll be good enough. Then there are other things that you need to constantly be practicing probably for the rest of your life. History taking is one of them. Remember also that you must know these things. There's no way that you can fluke your way through your Anoski exams. The mouth cannot say what the brain doesn't know. So as long as you haven't come across it, you haven't read about it, you have no idea about it, it makes it very difficult for you to perform when you come to the OSCE exams. And remember, the key thing is that if you fail one station, it doesn't mean that you have necessarily failed the exam, unless if your exam is based on one station. But still, if you fail one station or two stations, do not break down. Often we've seen students break down in the exam just because they failed the, the first two st stations that they've gotten to. They have failed those stations and they break down at the third station and you end up doing horrible at the rest of the exams. Even though you have failed the first station, do not break down. Keep yourself together. Keep moving. You may not know. You may have done okay. Do better at the other stations and you pass your exams. If you keep those three points in mind, I can even say we can end the video right here, but I know there are some people that still want more details. So if you do still want more details, keep watching the video. So the format of the OSCE exams are going to include the following things. You have stations on history taking, and I've actually divided this lecture into parts. Part one is going to be on history taking. Part two is on physical examinations. Part three is for the procedural skills. Part four is for the investigations. Part five is the communication skills. Part six is for the emergency stations and part seven, which is the last part is miscellaneous things because we already know that it's not possible to study for everything in an OSCE exam because there are different things that the myriad of things that can be brought by just one particular station is so much. For example, if you have a case of anemia, you can either ask students to number one, 
take a history. Number two, you could bring an FBC and you ask them to interpret. Number four, on that anemia patient, you could bring a blood sample and ask them how much is found in this unit of blood. How are you going to give it? What are the blood transfusion reactions? You know, how are you going to manage? So just on anemia on its own, you could have many different ways of which you can ask these particular questions. But most of your OSCE stations are going to be revolving around these seven parts. So part one, which is going to be history taking. Remember that history taking is a very important skill in medicine because it's going to be accounting for 90% of the information that's going to help you reach a diagnosis for your patients. History is very important. You must develop the art of taking a concise history and you should be very thorough. Do not take so much of your time on your history taking stations. These are stations where sometimes there may be some questions that may accompany your history afterwards to see if you have gotten the gist where the examiner will ask you about the diagnosis or the examiner will ask you about what other investigations you would order. So you should develop the art of taking history. The way I like to actually improve this particular station is I like to think of it like this. Suppose I'm reading on a topic. Suppose I'm reading on heart failure. And I ask myself, suppose a patient presented with these symptoms of heart failure, what other questions would I ask that may help me come to a diagnosis of heart failure? There's something that we call the approach to patients. So once you do this for every, in each of the conditions that you're reading as you're studying for your exam, it makes it very easy for you to have that idea of the questions that you're going to be asking on the history. So the important things to be keeping in mind when you're taking history is you want to have a format in your mind. We always assume that you're in the emergency department. When you're in the emergency department, you're not going to take 50 years to take a history because there's a queue waiting for you. You have to be very quick. You have to be very concise and get relevant information to be able to come to a diagnosis. So once you create this template in your mind, it's very easy, if, regardless of whatever you're asked, it's very easy for you to come and get a, a relevant history and to come to a diagnosis. You should have an organized approach to taking your history that goes hand in hand with having a format in your mind. Be mindful of the time. Don't spend too little time. Don't spend too much time on a particular part of your history. Make sure that it is thorough and it covers all the essential part. A good history, someone once said, a good history is like a miniskirt. It is short, but yet covers all the essential parts. That's how your history should be. That's how your summary should be. Short and yet covering all the essential parts. So you should assure the patient and be confidential at all times. Always greet the patients. These are free marks that people often overlook. You forget to say hello to the patient. You forget to ask for their name. You forget to get consent. You forget to thank the patient afterwards. It's quite weird, even in real life. I'm sure you wouldn't, you wouldn't be thrilled if someone just walked up to you and just started asking you personal questions. Hey, how many sexual partners do you have? Where do you stay? you would think of this person like a stalker or this person is doing other things. So you want to make sure that you should greet your patients, uh, explain your role and what you're going to do. And of course, once you're done, even if you're not done, if the time is up, make sure you thank the patient. Those are marks. You may sometimes not even finish taking the history, but you realize that you score very high on the marking scheme because you have taken it in a professional manner. You have thanked the patient at the end, even though you didn't finish. While as someone could have finished taking the history in a disorganized manner and they'll score less than you have scored, but you haven't finished the station, which is why it's very important to be professional. At the same time, you should show some empathy. Do not be robotic. Don't just ask questions for the sake of asking questions. These are humans that we're dealing with. We're testing your skill to take history in real life. So you should show some empathy. Be confident at the same time, but not too confident. Maintain good eye contact with the person that you're talking to. Be an active listener. Ask open-ended questions and be mindful for the nonverbal cues, so the body language of the patient. Sometimes even the body language of the examiner. Some examiners often tend to behave in a certain way when you are actually swaying away from the marking key. Some examiners may be misleading, so also be quite careful of this. So what sections do we have? So suppose you're asked to take a history. This is the format that you would keep in mind. So there should always be an introduction. You greet yourself, you I'd rather greet the patient, you introduce yourself in the role of what you're going to do, get consent. Confirm the patient's name, the age, the date of birth to ensure that you have the correct patient. You don't want to be asking questions to someone who's not even a patient. You should establish some rapport and make sure that the patient is comfortable. Then the next section is the presenting complaint. You could ask something simple like, what brings you here? Or 
what has brought you here today? And so it, this should be an open-ended question. It's not what are you sick of? That's not a good thing to ask or a good question to ask even in real life. And of course, when it comes to the history of presenting complaints, you want to explore the, the problem that is there. When did it start? Ask about the location, the duration, the character of the symptoms. Inquire about any aggravating or alleviating factors. This is just part of normal history taking. And history taking is a subject that is done in almost every course in the clinical clerkships. So I'm sure you, each of you that's watching this video should be able to take a good history. You should be able to review the systems, ask about systemic questions relating to the other body systems. A good approach is coming from head to toe, CNS, CVS, respiratory system, GIT, GUT, musculoskeletal system, and the skin. You should be thorough but yet concise. Ask about the past medical history, chronic conditions like diabetes, epilepsy, asthma, TB, hypertension, hepatitis, sickle cell. This is abbreviated as the pneumonic deaths, as well as HIV. Then ask for any prior surgeries, any prior hospitalizations, any prior blood transfusions, any prior major illnesses that may be related to your history. Ask about the medication as well as the diet. Do they have any prescription medication or over-the-counter medication? If they do, what is the kind of medication? How often do they take it? Do they have any drug allergies or food allergies? Do they have any adverse drug reactions? And wherever necessary, if it's in uh, obstetrics and gynecology, ask for the past obstetric and gyne history as well as the current obstetric history. If it's in pediatrics, don't forget to ask about the birth, immunization, and developmental history whenever necessary. Family history is just going to be really focusing on significant medical conditions that may be running in the family, things like diabetes, epilepsy, asthma, um, things like TB, hypertension, or even sickle cell. Ask about first degree relatives, the parents, the siblings, the children. Social history, you want to focus on things like occupation, marital status of the patient, the living condition, their sexual history, smoking, alcohol, or substance abuse. And then once you have taken this very quickly, it's very possible to get a quick history in within five minutes and come to your summary. You're going to ask if this patient has any concerns or any questions, summarize your key points, then you're going to thank your patients. It's very easy to score 10 out of 10 or 20 out of 20 in these particular stations. So here's a summary to help you. Appropriate introductions, confirm the patient's name, explain the reason for the consultation, obtain consent. You open your questions with uh, the presenting complaint, open-ended questions, your history of presenting complaints, your past medical history, your family history, your drug history, birth, immunization, and past or current obstetric and gynecological history whenever necessary, your social history, your review of systems, you explore and you respond to ideas and concerns. For example, if a patient says, oh, by the way, I've also been experiencing this symptom, you should dive into that symptom a bit further. Don't just brush off the patient's concerns. You should be able to show some empathy, have some nonverbal skill, um, that should be should be able to pick up. You should avoid any medical terminology. This one here is an underrated thing that most people don't think. Even though the examiner may be an actor, it may be a doctor, it may be a healthcare worker, do not assume. The best way to go into a history taking station is always assume that the patient knows nothing of what you're talking about. Use the most simple terminology as possible. Then of course summarize, offer to answer any questions, and thank the patients. That's how you pass history taking stations. The commonly asked presenting complaints are things like chest pains, cough, hemoptysis, headaches, shortness of breath, fever, weight loss, generalized lethargy or tiredness, abdominal pains, change in bowel habit, tenderness, a patient that has recently collapsed, rectal bleeding, jaundice, dysphagia, alcohol misuse, upper GI bleeding, lower GI bleeding, PV bleeding, dysuria, hematuria, amenorrhea, postquatal bleeding, and postmenopausal bleeding. Of course, this is not an exhaustful list, but these are the commonly asked presenting complaints. So your task now is to look at these complaints and see, draft something down and write something down in a notebook or somewhere. And like, if I had chest pain, what questions would I ask? If I had a cough, what questions would I ask? And then be going through that so that you create that template and you're able to create those questions even when you are in the exam setting. That's part one. So in terms of part two, which is much easier, the physical examination stations. These ones, if no one has shown you the right technique, 
it's very difficult for you to do these physical examinations, but there are some pointers that I'm going to allude to. Remember that here the examiner is looking at your ability to carry out a full examination in the stipulated time with the right technique and the right speed. I'm not looking at the ability of whether you are able to detect pathology or not, no. Because most of the times the patients that they give you, the model patients they give you, are going to be patients that are normal, that don't have any problems. So the examiner is just looking at your ability and your technique. So there are some, sometimes there are some clues that can be there in the history that is presented to you that can guide your focused examination. And you should always, at all times, begin from the foot end of the bed and you should always examine the patient from the right side of the patient's bed or the right side of the patient. If the right side of the patient's bed is against the wall, mention it to the examiner. Ideally, I would have loved to examine the patient from the right side. May I be allowed to examine from the left side? Don't just assume that the examiner knows. So you should actually point this out. Then the examiner will know that you know exactly what you're talking about. So you should always, just like with the history, introduce yourself, your name, your role, Confirm the patient's name, the date of birth, and ensure that you have the right patient. You should establish some rapport. Make sure that the patient is comfortable. Just like you're watching this video and you're comfortable, so should the patient be. Explain the purpose of the physical examination and you should ask and tell this patient if they're in any pain, they should let you know so that you can stop the examination. Then you should ask them if it's okay for you to carry on. Unless if stated otherwise, all examinations must begin with a general examination. So you must start with your general examination, your inspection, looking for any signs of distress or discomfort, look at the surroundings for anything that can help in this particular condition, observe for any abnormalities, any asymmetry, any deformities, note the general appearance, the vital signs, the overall demeanor of the patient. Vital signs are going to be things like blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature, which must be incorporated in your exam. There are different techniques of how you examine patients in different scenarios and I'm sure those are topics for another day and if you've ever been to a clinical ward you should be able to know this and of course there should be a systemic approach remember most of our exams are going to follow our IPPA approach inspection palpation percussion auscultation and whenever you're carrying out a physical examination it's a running commentary you're commenting I am looking for this I am looking for that I am looking for this don't just be quiet it should be a running commentary. So you should examine the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the GIT, the musculoskeletal system, and the neurological system. Then of course, you should maintain clear and open communication with the patient throughout the exam. Guide them, lift your hand up. Can you stretch out your hand? Be clear in your instructions. Explain each step of the examination before you proceed. Say what you're looking for and be attentive to whether the patient is comfortable and make sure that there's some privacy. Once you are done, you should summarize your patient findings, ask if the patient has any concerns, and of course thank the patient for their cooperation and inform them of the next steps, for example, if they have any investigations that they need to be carried out. Some commonly asked stations that you should practice at home, how to do a cardiovascular examination, a respiratory examination, an abdominal examination, a rectal examination. They may not necessarily ask you to do a full CNS examination on your exams because it takes quite a long time, but they may ask you components. For example, perform a cranial nerve one test, cranial nerve two, specific cranial nerves, or they can do, they can say perform an upper limb motor examination or a lower limb motor examination. Examination of the breast, though this one also may be a bit tricky to do in an exam setting. Examination of an ulcer, an obstetric examination, a vaginal speculum examination, a thyroid examination, and even examination of the newborn. If they have some uh, medical props, sometimes they do ask you to do this. So that's part two. Then part three is to do with procedure skills. This is where now different procedures are going to be displayed. So I have left a link in the comment, in the description rather. I've left a link in the description and I think I'll pin it as a, as a pinned comment as well for those that do not know how to read descriptions. I'll leave it as a pinned comment to a link of the book that was released as a giveaway of helping us reach 13,000 subscribers. I will leave it pinned in the comment section below. Please go download the book. It's just 
based on obstetrics and gynecology procedures. And please take note that those procedures, it's not every procedure that you need to, that every procedure that is there that is important for you to know. There are some procedures that are missing from that book. I have even listed them out as procedures that you should know but are not in this particular book. That book is not a substitute for you to discard everything else that you're studying and just focus on that book. No, it's just meant to supplement the things that are there and to make your life a whole lot easier. So remember that the procedure stations are designed to assess your ability, um, your technical skills to execute a range of important diagnostic or even therapeutic procedures. At these procedure stations, you are going to be required to um, take or do relevant things or take uh, relevant procedures for specific clinical scenarios and your examiner is going to be observing if you're doing the right technique or if you're performing these things right. Don't overcomplicate simple things. Keep it as simple. Simple things will always be simple. So just some general points. You should understand the task that is given to you. Introduce yourself um, to the patient or to the actor. Get consent of what you're going to do. Make sure you always wash your hands and wear gloves when appropriate. Have a methodical approach to a certain thing. For example, when you're doing an NGT, there's a way in which you're going to be performing an NGT in session. There's a standard procedure for that. And also make it very clear to the examiner what you're going to do so that each step gets noticed. Then, of course, once you're done with everything, you should clean up the procedure, clean up all your things that you've been using, dispose the shops in the shops box, then, of course, thank the patient, and you should be confident when you are doing all these things for procedure stations. Common procedures include lumbar puncture, performing simple suturing. I think there was a video that was released. Um, I think it should have been a year or so ago. Yo, the suturing techniques of some of those candidates. Yo, if you were the head of that hospital, you would transfer this person because you'd constantly be buying suture material. There are a lot of people that were quite wasteful on that video. Then the blood pressure measurement, urethral catheterization, nasogastric tube insertion, blood glucose estimation, vena puncture, peripheral venous cannulation, writing a drug chart, intravenous drug administration, cervical smears, correct condom use, cardiopulmonary respiration, how to perform a manual vacuum, vacuum aspiration, manual removal of the placenta, how to perform neonatal intubation, basic laboratory procedures like how to do an RGT for malaria, RPR for syphilis, HIV test, thoracosynthesis, abdominal synthesis, oxygen administration, and then of course perform and repair episiotomy and even cervical tears. Of course, for the obstetric procedures, we have the book that was released in the description below and the pinned comment on this particular video. Then moving on to part four is the investigation stations. This is where you're now going to be being able to interpret certain investigations. So here you should be well versed with the basic investigation and even some specialist tests. It would be a big mistake if the candidate just reads out these values to the examiner without even commenting whether they are high or low. So you should be able to know the normal parameters of each of the investigations, which are very, very common. Know the normal parameters such that sometimes they may give you an investigation that has no parameters. You should be able to tell whether this is high or low and how it influences the differential diagnosis. Some commonly asked investigations include a full blood count, liver function test, partograph interpretation, electrocardiograms, chest x-ray, abdominal x-rays, urinalysis, arterial blood gases, serum electrolytes, TSF analysis, and pleural fluid analysis. Part five has to do with communication skills, your ability to relay information to the patient, your ability to counsel the patient on certain things, and your ability to speak to people. Just like I'm speaking to you in this particular video, communication skills can be greatly enhanced. Even presentation skills can be greatly enhanced. Good communication is central to you passing your exam, not just only in this station, but in all the stations, good communication will help you pass the exams. And this is going to be tested in majority of the stations. So here you should be able to interact with the patient. You should be able to interact with the relative. You should be able to interact with the fellow health professions, even though they are playing the role of an actor. So communication skills are the main skill that's actually being tested in most stations. And the candidate is going to be marked on the ability to communicate and the ability to relay information accurately. 
So the general points for the communication skills. So obviously you're going to introduce yourself just like any other station. Confirm your patient's name and explain what the patient is there for and your role there. Obtain consent. You should start with two open questions and a minute of silence. Ask if it's a counseling station, ask them what they know about what you're counseling them for. You don't want to start counseling a patient who is already knowledgeable about the condition, and then you'll be wasting time. Then you should be able to apply ideas, concerns, and expectations of the patient, explore any psychosocial factors, and you should use a patient-centered approach and work in partnership with the patient. Do not judge. So you must show empathy at all times. Use simple words and appropriate language. Avoid using medical terms. This is where it's very difficult because sometimes translating medical terms into simple terms may not be so easy. So you should be practicing with your buddies at home, with your study buddies, with your study groups. So you should be able to listen carefully and you should be attentive to the nonverbal cues because they are also ways of communicating. Maintain good eye contact. Check that the patient is understanding at regular intervals. The best way to actually check if someone is understanding you is just ask them to repeat what you have said. If they're able to repeat it correctly, then most likely they understand. Then, of course, you should acknowledge the gaps in your own information. This is a point that is underrated because I don't know is a better answer than lying in medicine. You're better off saying, I'm not so sure about that, but I'll consult with my seniors and I'll get back to you. Is that okay? So you should offer to discuss with your seniors wherever you don't know. And you should use the signposting appropriately. Give the patient any information, leaflet if possible. Then, of course, you should offer any contact details, support groups, wherever it's appropriate. Summarize your things, ask if they have any questions, and at all times, thank the patient when you are done. So commonly asked things is for you to explain diagnosis, to explain prognosis of certain conditions, to explain laboratory or medical imaging test results, to explain drug interaction or side effects, to explain treatment um, regimens, procedures to a patient or any patient concerns, for you to abstain um, consent for specific procedures. For example, they may tell you go cancel this patient for lumbar puncture so that they get the consent to get a lumbar puncture. Breaking bad news, disclosing a medical error, dealing with a difficult or angry patient or relative, counseling the patient or even patient education, exploring reasons for non-compliancy, counseling them for an HIV test, counseling them for postnatal injury or splash injury. These are the commonly things that are asked on your OSCE station. Again, this is not an exhaustful list as the number of things that can be asked on the station are very wide, but the principle remains the same. Then second last thing is the emergency stations. So remember that here, an emergency OSC is quite important because it's going to assess your ability to manage patients acutely and to manage them safely. Here you must have a good idea of the dosages of certain drugs, how to perform certain things in emergency setups. Each and every single course has its own emergencies. So here, this station is going to worry a lot of medical students because it's unpredictable most unpredictable thing, and it's going to be demanding a spot decision to be made at that particular station. So things that commonly asked, basic life support, how to do CPR, very important, airway management, Glasgow Coma Scale, abortions, ectopic, how you're going to manage, triage, dehydration, shock, pneumonias, meningitis, malnutrition, heart failure, sickle cell crisis, seizures, a patient coming in actively bleeding, PV bleeding or bleeding from elsewhere. And the last and final part are, of course, the miscellaneous, because no one can be 100% predictable. There are other things that you can't predict even in the exam. They must just show up as random pictures, random specimens, random things, random drugs that you may have been using on the ward. So this is just to test your overall information on the subject and to just see the differentiate, what I like to say, differentiate between A plus and A, B plus and B. So there may be drugs like contraceptives, oxytocin, magnesium sulfate. It may be random pictures. I'm sure you have seen a lot of pictures that we've covered on the different um, MK's exam secrets, on the pictures on the bazooka, many different things that we've looked at. It could be instruments, whether surgical obstetrics. It could be triage stations. It could be fractures, antenatal screening, immunization, pre-op or post-op care, death certification, many different things that can come here. And like I told you, the myriad of things that you can be asked in an OSCE thing is wide. But once you use this approach to prepare, it makes it very easy for you to pass the exam. So always keep in mind that do not be discouraged if you fail one station. 
there is hope. You may do better. You may fail one station and do better at the nine other stations. But imagine this, you fail one station, you break down and you do horribly at the other nine stations. You have failed the exam. If you fail one station, keep a positive attitude, do better at the next thing. Don't let that station hold you down. Go to the next station, be free-minded, do better. Always be confident, don't be overconfident, be confident. Don't be scared to say that you don't know that, you'll find out. It's also an answer. Have enough knowledge and you should execute this knowledge in a professional manner. You should. You can only have this knowledge by practice. No one is born knowing everything. Even us who are making these videos, there was at one point where we were also watching other videos and then we got to practice and then this is where we are today. And at all times, I always tell my students this, at all times, breathe. Whenever you're under pressure, take a deep breath, compose yourself. A way that I like to compose myself, especially during oral exams or during OSCE exams, is I'll first breathe, repeat the question in my mind. As I'm repeating the question in my mind, I'm gathering my thoughts and I'm able now to answer in a very systematic manner. If I don't know, then I don't know. They say that it takes only nine seconds for someone to respond to you. So within nine seconds, if you don't respond to the examiner, it means that most likely you won't respond or most likely you don't know. So those are the important things and the advice I can give you in terms of passing OSCE stations and passing OSCE exams. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider subscribing, drop a comment to show some support, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.